Ah, now I think it works. <laughs> no more questions? Everything is clear like a glass? Some of you, as I understand, have some, inf some knowledge about economic theory. Before we do this math, uh, a few words about this topic, okay? I assume all of us are aware of the fact that money and economics is important, okay? Economists tend to say that people's greed can explain everything. Sometimes I say the same, sometimes I don't. Hello. Hello. What's your name? Bonita. Bonita? Monica. Okay, Monica. Yeah. Where are you from, Monica? Um, from Uganda. From Uganda. Okay, so we have her from Africa as well. That's nice. Sorry, I got... You got I captured. Got you got the wrong bus. Yeah, that's around Molde. Oh, so you had a nice sightseeing then. All around Molde. <laughs> Did you see some nice sights? Yeah, I did. Ah, okay, that's good. Yeah, we're here. My name is Kjetil Hagen. We are starting this course in uh, Introduction to Sport and Event Economics. Yeah. Yeah, where was I? I was starting to talk about economic theory, wasn't I? Yeah. Yeah, economists tend to explain everything which happens in the world through economic theory. Uh, uh, and of course, if and basically, uh, the only assumption you make in economic theory is greed. Okay, so if you assume that everybody is greedy, then you can kind of use that assumption to kind of find out a lot. So it's kind of a neat platform. It's a very simple platform to explain a lot of stuff. Of course, you can't explain everything, but uh, sometimes something can be explained. We are, uh, I would expect, familiar with the, the case that if uh, prices go up, people buy less. Normally, if prices go down, people buy more. If uh, wages to people in factories go up, then less people are hired, perhaps. If wages go down, it's easier for the manager to hire more people. So there is some obvious kind of things which is, uh, which is here. But of course, economic theory is a little bit more than just this. A lot of students find economic theory quite difficult. And I remember the first time I had it, I found it difficult because it's kind of a weird mixture between relatively simple logic, but also quite complex mathematical models. And uh, in many cases, when you have a course in economics, typically in microeconomics, as we will have here, it may be hard to see the link between kind of the basic assumption and the model you look at. It, it kind of becomes kind of big, this link, from this simple greed assumption and up to all these complex formulas we can derive. And the reason is normally that there's a kind of a, a long story in between here. So most lecturers tend to forget this story, or maybe some of them can't do the story. Maybe they never have learned it and so on. So so you should always be suspicious when people tell you what economic theory is. It's not uh, necessarily that easy. And this mix between, should we say, mathematical modeling and economic reasoning is not obvious. It's not easy. As you probably know, the only non-science subject where they hand out Nobel Prizes is in economics. Okay? And th there's a reason for that. So somebody seems to believe that economic theory is very complex. And in some cases it can be. We will try to keep it uh, at a reasonable level here. Okay. When we talk about economic theory, we, we often uh, discuss markets. Do you know what a market is? Now this was a rhetoric question. You don't have to answer. Okay. If I want you to answer, then I stand up and point at you. Okay. A market is somewhere where transactions take place, where you can all buy and sell something. Okay. In many cases, when you use this market term, it may be confusing because when you talk about the market, you kind of your mind goes to some place, for instance, in Turkey, where there is a bazaar. 
you enter this bazaar and some everybody is buying and selling a lot there okay uh, today market is more like a, should we say a abstract concept it could be a lot more complicated than that but the idea is still remaining if somebody buys something from somebody and of course at the same time somebody sells something to the, the buyer then we have a market So we have markets for cars, we have markets for oil, we have markets for dentistry, for medical services, we have markets for events in general, and uh, especially, for instance, for sport. So there are certain markets for the activity we are interested in this course. And the reason why we ki kind of have these courses where, where uh, we kind of have a look at the economics of special markets is that there is difference between different markets. So if you sell oil or if you sell bananas, then uh, there are certain things that need to be done. But if you sell uh, events, there are other things that has to be done. If you think about an event, for instance, which is uh, something which is relevant both in sports as well as in other cultural activities when we talk about events we normally look at a broader perspective okay so in sports you know then we talk about football or cross country or whatever but when we talk about events so, so typically sports is a part of it but then there's a a lot of different stuff okay it could be theater it could be film opera authorship there's a lot of uh, services which are pr provided for people's entertainment which are not sports but of course a big part of this is sports you probably know that the persons in the world that earns most money either are football players or authors or actors, aren't they? So obviously there must be a market here. Because the big part of these guys, they don't earn anything at all, more or less, okay? 99% of all football players earn almost nothing. But there is a single percent who earns a real lot. The same you see in famous authors, famous actors, opera singers, whatever, okay? So, one thing which is interesting with sport and event markets is this kind of, should we say, exaggeration, okay? So you kind of get this situation where very few people earn a lot, very lot of money. If you compare these to other markets, if you look at uh, those who manufacture and sell cars, for instance, of course there is a difference between the manager and the guy at the floor, but this difference is not that big. So we get uh, a very, and that's perhaps what's interested me with this sport and event stuff is that uh, uh, the economics becomes very clear in a sense. It, it's, it kind of steps forward and shows very clearly how, in a sense, capitalism works. Okay, because um, we see these major differences between those who earn a lot and those who earn a little. So that is something we will discuss in this course, okay? What is it that separates these markets? What, what makes sports markets, for instance, different from other markets? And, and to some extent, we already know this, don't we? If you look at sports, uh, we have a so what we may call a defined competitive structure. If you think about cars, for instance, you don't have that. Uh, there is not a kind of set of rules that says that the best car is Ferrari. The second best is Maserati and so on, okay? We don't have that. The market always decides what are best here and who are best. On the sports side, on the other hand, it's different, isn't it? Because the sport itself defines the quality here. So if Liverpool is the best team in Premier League, then they are the best team. There's no doubt about that. There is a table defining that. This definition is important because it kind of separates at least the sport parts from all other economic activity, almost. So we have a kind of clear-cut definition of quality here. You don't have that in most other markets. The market itself dynamically decides these quality differences. Of course, this is one of the reasons why sport and event economics is very clear-cut, very easy to see differences. Another interesting feature here is that a lot of people believe 
that when we move along from now, there will be fewer and fewer people who are engaged in traditional manufacturing and production. The reason is kind of obvious, isn't it? We see robots, we see computers, we see a lot of technical aids that could kind of remove people from normal manufacturing and production. When I use the term manufacturing, I mean situations where you produce something physical, okay, a car or a chair or clothes or whatever. The other part of production we refer to as service production or services. Okay? And obviously events and sport events are service production. Okay? We produce not something physical, but some kind of experience for those who want to consume these products. And a lot of people think that due to this argument, in the future, 50, 100, 200 years in from now, there will be almost nobody engaged in this traditional manufacturing. Of course, the rest, those who had don't have a job in that situation, will have to do something else then. Okay? And of course, service production is something we probably will keep on doing. Don't you think so? We, have, we need to have doctors, we need to have lawyers, we need to have shopkeepers, we need, we need to have football teams and opera singers, perhaps. Okay? So, presumably, in the future, there will be a larger share of the world population who kind of works in this part of the economy, selling themselves in a larger deal than they did used to do in the old manufacturing regime. Because a factory is kind of a community where you need everybody to kind of together to produce the final product if it's a car. If you buy a car, you really don't know the name of the designer, do you? Or the guy who kind of made this very nice new system in the engine. You, you really don't have any idea about that. Your idea is linked to the final product. But in the future service world, you kind of have a link to the actual person. The doctor, the lawyer, the dentist, the football player, or whatever. These differences are important. In the classical world, you normally have a situation where you manufacture a product and then you take that product and bring it to the consumer. If I buy a car here, it is definitely not produced in Norway because we don't produce any cars in Norway. Of course, in the Czech Republic you still do, don't you? Skoda is still up and running high. Okay? So Norway is like an underdeveloped country on the car side. Okay? We don't have any car factories here. I don't think that they maybe they still have some in Sweden, I think, yeah. Volvo is still, maybe it's not Swedish anymore, it's Chinese, isn't it? Yeah, yeah Volvo is, is Chinese. Okay, but they still have some factories in Sweden, I think. Of course, Germany is the big car country in Europe, isn't it? Volkswagen, Mercedes, Do you, uh, BMW, BMW, yeah, yeah, at least three big brands, very large share of the world market. But the car I buy down at the shop here is being transported and if it's a Volkswagen from Germany up here, isn't it? Yeah. To me. In the, on, the, on the event side, it's the opposite way around, isn't it? You don't bring the product to the consumer, the consumer goes to the product. Okay? If I want to see the football team, I have to go down to the stadium. Okay? If I want to see Barcelona, I have to travel down to, to Spain and go to New Camp. Okay? If that's the right stadium, is it? No. Yeah, it is. Great. Yeah. So th there's a difference, isn't it? So instead of transporting products, you transport people to events. Okay. So it's a kind of a different, the reversed situation. This is important. So these are some of the reasons, kind of why we can kind of think about event or sport economics. Okay. Th there are differences here, major differences. A very important difference when it comes to sports is related to competition. Because if you think about it, let's think about the car manufacturers. Okay, in Germany there is Volkswagen, uh, there is uh, BMW, and there is Mercedes. Okay, maybe there are more, but at least those three. I don't, I don't think they are kind of owned together. Caroline, do you can you tell me what do you know about the car manufacturers in Germany? Do, do they have the same owner, or are they kind of different? Companies competing. Mm. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, Audi. Yeah, I didn't mention Audi. There are there there are some kind of cooperation here. I know that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I don't really know actually. The point I want to reach is the following, okay? If you are a car manufacturer, then it would be beneficial for you, wouldn't it, if one of your competing agents is bankrupt. That would be good for you. Do you agree? If I produce cars and I compete heavily with this factory next city, and if that factory is bankrupt, then it's nice for me. Typically, I would sell more cars then. Okay? If you think about football, the situation is not as easy, is it? Because in football, to produce the product, you need more than one agent. Okay? To play a football match, at least you have to have two teams. Okay? These two teams are competing. Normally, there are more than two teams. Okay? So, in the sports scene, to produce the product, there must be some competition. Okay? There must be more than one agent competing against the other agent to make the product or to give it value, so to speak. So, for a certain football team in Germany, let's say Bayern Munich, it would not necessarily be nice if Borussia Dortmund is bankruptcy, would it? Maybe in the short run, but perhaps not in the long run. I once was at a football match watching Borussia Dortmund. West Fallen Stadium, could that be correct? Yeah, there is a stadium down there in the mid part of Germany. It, there was enormous amount of people there, more than 80,000 actually. Of course, these 80,000 people, they would perhaps not go to see Bayern Munich play. At least it's, it's quite a distance from this side down to Munich. It's uh, not something you do on a Sunday drive. So that would be problematic, okay? So you cannot kind of compete as you do in other markets when you're in sports markets. On the event side, it's not as in sports, but at the same time not as in manufacturing, okay? It's not necessarily such that if one author writes a very nice book, then you sell less of the book you write. It could actually be the other way around, couldn't it? It could a very popular book could create enhanced interest for literature in general, so you can kind of get more sales if there are, let's say, in Norway we have a popular crime author called Jon Espoo, have you heard about him? He's actually from this town, did you know that? Yeah, yeah. He is the guy who wrote the song they sung at the stadium yesterday. Yeah, he, he is also a pop popular musician, actually. What was my point? <laughs> Yeah, it's about time for a break anyway, okay? <laughs> 15 minutes from now.